Welcome to the Fieldhouse Strength Podcast. Fieldhouse Strength Podcast. If it's strength and conditioning, powerlifting, athlete performance, general fitness, and anything in between, we're talking about it. We're talking about it. Your hosts are pros who've done it all and here to share that knowledge with you. This is the Fieldhouse Strength Podcast. And here are your hosts, Sean Jones and Jonathan Bird. And welcome back to the Fieldhouse Strength Podcast. I'm Sean Jones, and with me as always is Jonathan Bird. Welcome. So, it's been a while. Yeah, we took a little hiatus because you know, life gets busy. Oh, man. Flu and football and... Yeah, we'll get, we'll get caught up. Yeah. yeah. So, you run into different challenges when you train certain people. Whether you're training yourself and you fit this profile, or you're training athletes, or you have a client, the size of your client sometimes matters. Now, what I mean by size, height, weight bone structure, you would certainly train somebody that's six foot seven differently than you would someone that's five foot seven, right, Bird? Yeah, yeah. The, the reality is anything training is not one size fits all. There's different types of athletes. There's different types of sizes. There's different types of frames. And all of those things kind of come into play. A six foot six basketball kid lengthwise could be a lot different than a six foot six offensive lineman. Take some some skill set to recognize what's going to be different and how to train them to get the best result. Yeah, and the goals are different. Yeah. We're going to get into that a little bit. So what are some inherent challenges that you've seen from, let's define it a little bit more specifically here, somebody that's tall, so 6'3 and above? Well, you know, long femurs create some issues in, in different movement patterns and things of that nature. That's always one of the big things that pop up when squatting and de- deadlifting any explosive type movements, those long femurs really matter. And you have to really pay attention to what you're teaching technically with those guys. Anything lower half wise for that matter. Yeah, and that makes sense because I'd, I'd always kind of known that people with longer legs had more issues with squats, that sort of thing, but I would not been specific about femur length like you had. And that makes a lot of sense because one thing that helps you to really assess a situation and get better at addressing it is understand everything you possibly can about how leverage works in that individual. Yep, exactly. And so first example here that I can remember is there was an offensive lineman at a place I used to coach at. He was our left tackle, so he was 6'5", probably 300 pounds. And he was squatting one day and could not squat 225 all the way down. And, you know, he was pretty strong and was able to handle himself on the field. He was a starter. So I started noticing he wasn't bending very much at the ankles, that kind of thing. So I propped his heels up, and he squatted 350. And then I got overruled by the older strength coach, and then he went back to squat 225. We never addressed it. Not that I knew exactly what to do about it, but based on what I saw, that's an issue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the biggest thing is you kind of got to define what your goal and what you're looking for when you're working with that athlete and then figuring out the process to get where you need to be. Bigger framed guys are always, for me, more difficult to work with, but more enjoyable because you got to find all the pieces to the puzzle. Right. Another thing I've noticed, too, one of the reasons I think it's difficult is they've never been made to get in some of the positions that smaller guys have. Yeah. So as far as being able to squat really low or crawl around, a lot of times their whole life they've been treated as a big guy. They don't have to do small guy things. Put out a scenario here. You're an O-line guy. What do you think tackles in particular, now there are obviously other tall big guys on the line, but tackles tend to be the tallest. What physical attributes do you look for in, an, in a tackle? Physical attributes meaning the things they do or their physical assets? Well, both. Okay, so the big thing is I want to see them be able to bend at the hip and knee. Um, I like to be able to see a good Z in their leg when they're mm-hmm. doing things. So with that being said, they should be able to squat two parallel. I'm not really asking them to squat below it. And then, honestly, once they get to a higher level, you know, they really don't squat. They do a lot of box squatting and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But I need to physically see them have a good Z in their leg, be able to bend at the hips, bend at the knee, and have good ankle mobility. If they can get those things accomplished, then we can build enough strength in the upper half 
that with that long frame be very successful. And most of the time, you could just tell them by having them squat down without weight, right? Yeah. So here's the one that always makes people giggle. Physically, I want to see them have a big ass. Yep. I know it's a weird statement. Oh, you know, talk about, but that guy's got a thick rear end, thick hamstrings, thick. That means he's got some power there. He may not have harnessed it yet. He may not have developed that yet, but the attributes are there. I had a coach that always said he could tell if a kid was a good athlete by his ankles. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, right. there's, but there's some truth behind that. That guy's able to play with some leverage and power. He just may not be able to demonstrate it in the weight room yet. And then once you get him to demonstrate it in the weight room, that kid normally can go to another level hmm. in skill set. Yeah, you talk about having a big behind. It's not a preference in terms of what we like to look at. Yeah, I'm not interested yeah. in looking at it. It's not, you know, it's, <laughs> not, not there's anything wrong with that. But yeah, they, anyway, <laughs> that's another thing. Whenever I was recruiting someone, I looked at them on film or I went to the school and talked with them, you just knew right away if they had a flat butt, they were done. Like they, There was nothing you could really do with them because that's something that needs to be there. That means that there's just not a lot of power in their hips. Yeah. So what is the one thing that you feel like most big guys, and I'm not talking about four-star recruits, but guys that we just discussed, what are issues besides flexibility? Let's look at what they're trying to accomplish in general. What do they need to work on? Speed, power, strength? Well, we touched on it uh, in some prior things before. The reality is it takes longer to build strength than it does speed. And normally, if you can build some strength, you can build some speed. You know, the stronger they are, the more they have to put force to the ground, get in better body positions, things of that nature. So, really, the first thing for me is being able to get the person to perform movements correctly. And once we can perform the movements correctly, I can make anybody strong. Right. And that's the thing is you really can't consider yourself strong unless you're doing it correctly. Yeah. You know, everybody has seen the videos of high school and college strength coaches power cleaning kids and it looks like you know Bambi walking knees slamming together people falling all over the place and I've, I've been victim of that before too because you get some kids in the weight room who shouldn't be in the weight room and it's really hard to coach 60 plus kids by yourself yeah. but you shouldn't be maxing them out right so the, the reality of it is uh, if I've got a guy who is willing to spend the time in here big small doesn't matter I can make them a pretty decent athlete, at least a better athlete, mm -hmm. and stronger. Yeah. To do that, you must be able to do the movements correctly. Yeah, and like the tackle I mentioned before, he would have been much better off. Now, knowing what I know now, to have gone way, way lighter and just gotten a full range of motion because there were muscles that weren't even being activated. Correct. I, you know, I've got guys still that – until you can get a full parallel squat, man, we, we don't go over like 70%. Like, you know, I, yeah, I know it's easy, but you're not doing it correctly. So it doesn't really matter if that part's easy. We're doing three-fourths of the lift right now. And you're doing a good morning. Yeah, you know, and so we've got to get that kind of squared away before we move on. And, you know, the reality of it is a lot of times it's, you know, hip flexibility and ankle mobility. If you're able to work on those things, then normally they can perform a good squat correctly or a good clean, and work on the front squat and slowly work them down. It's just a process and it takes time. And most people aren't willing to invest the time in their athletes to get the best results out of it. Yeah, and so let's talk about specific issues. So you get a larger guy that comes in, he's already pretty strong, but he's not very powerful or explosive. And what I mean by power is Max strength is I can move, create a lot of force, move a lot of weight. It doesn't matter how fast I do it. But power is how much can you move quickly. So if you've got a guy that's already got good numbers, he's a big, strong ox, but he's not very explosive, then what I have found to be true is, especially in the short term, you need to focus more on speed. Lighten the weight, you know, maybe, fast, maybe box squat. What are some more... What are some movements that you would do to develop that burst, that explosiveness? Well, see, it's funny that you bring that up because the, the, our program now is currently kind of in that phase. We're finally getting guys that are strong. Now we've got to be able to make it more dynamic. So we're doing, you know, a lot of – do a lot of stuff with chain because I just have enough space for chain. I don't have enough band set up. But, you know, there's a lot of speed work that we do. We'll stay at about 60% range and do – 10 sets of three, trying to move the bar extremely quickly. 
And the kids look at it as, oh, we're having a lighter day. But they don't realize the intensity that is going into it. So they don't even realize the amount of work they put in, which is good for me because, you know, we can do it on game days and they don't realize that, oh, this was really, you know, easy day. I'm like, no, no, it wasn't easy at all. Your body just is adjusting to this. Um, so a lot of speed work, a lot of plyometrics and jumping. I sneak a lot of that in. Some of it single legs, some of it dual legs, some of it multi-plane jumps, you know, a lot of variations of what we do. I try to keep it really interesting with for the younger guys, you know, my high school age kids, because the more interested in and the more challenge they're able to do, the more effort they'll put into it. Yeah. And for those that don't know, explain the benefit of using chains. Okay. So the idea is, in, in simplest terms, is it weighs a certain amount at the top, let's just say 300 pounds, okay, mm -hmm. between the bar, the weight on it, and the chain. As you go down, the chain starts hitting the ground and it gets lighter. So let's say we put 100 pounds of chain on it. So when it gets all the way to the bottom, now there's 200 pounds in the bottom. So to effectively get the use out of it, you have to outrun that chain, meaning you have to be explosive all the way through that plane of movement because it's obviously going to get heavier at the top. Yes, it was 200 pounds down there, but it's going to be 300 pounds at the top. And if you go slow, you're not going to be able to make it. So that gives them a marker in terms of whether or not they've got enough speed. Have you ever used an accelerometer before? I have not. Obviously, I've been to a seminar or two where, you know, they've had them. And I've, I've used a digital type one on a cell phone that calculates bar speed and trajectory. And, but never with the kids because mm -hmm. it's just a lot of work for me and they're not going to spend it anyway. Yeah, and I've got a, I'm a fan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, very beneficial. But it's a real investment to make. Correct. But I, I used one with a client, just a, you know, everyday client. And she doesn't like working out at all. Mm -hmm. Doesn't put in a lot of effort. Not because she's being hard to deal with, but she just doesn't like it. So I used the accelerometer teaching her the kettlebell swing. And her kettlebell swings have been perfect ever since. No, no kidding. Yeah, because she was able to understand what that velocity needed to be to get yeah, to that number. And I wasn't using the correct force to get there. Yeah. You know, I, and, you know, I'm a big RPE guy, range mm -hmm. of exertion. So, like, it would be very beneficial for, for me. I got very good at watching a video and determining my bar speed and saying, okay, I had this many left or that many left. Right. My big benefit, and I really probably wouldn't fall, I guess I'd fall in the category of a big guy because I was 300 pounds, but I'm 5'11 on a good day. I had incredible bar speed, mm -hmm. but I could not grind a weight to save my life and never have, was able to develop that. And it's kind of interesting that all my clients always ended up being the same way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess it was a way that, a way that I teach people to train is explosive and not much grinding ability there. Yeah. Well, and I'm not sure how that always translates to powerlifting, but it's certainly a good thing for sports. Yeah, and it worked out great for powerlifting, too. You know, yeah. the best could do both, and I, I was never really good at doing both. But if I turned it around quickly, I was going to get the best. You know, and that yeah. Was One thing that you have, to, you have to take into consideration, a couple things you have to take into consideration are when you start to work with younger athletes, how long have they been lifting? What is their goal? Obviously, we just talked about that. And – there's going to be a difference between what you do with a 12th grader and a 9th grader. Yeah, and, and so the reality is it, time under the bar really, really matters. And, you know, as I was speaking earlier about doing, like, dynamic-type lifting, it doesn't necessarily have to be against a band or a chain. You could still lower the weight and teach the child to try to move it fast, try to do it, you know what I mean, until they really understand it. Then you can add some accommodating resistance. But until you can truly do the pattern correctly and truly do the movement correctly, just give them a lighter day and try to enforce, just rep in their mind, hey, we're going to be explosive. We've got to go faster. We've got to go faster. Mm -hmm. Because thinking about going faster typically leads you to going faster. Right. And I have noticed that anytime you can just tell an athlete to do something without having to explain it a lot really helps. Give me an example. When I have kids jump up on a box, I tell them to land quietly. Mm -hmm. And they just do it. You know instinctually how to make less of a sound. And, you know, we're working with little kids, teaching a broad jump or something. Jump out like a frog does. You know, the more you can coach someone with short, pithy comments, the better off you are. And 
when we talk about someone being strong already or not, say you get an 11th grader that comes in, and we've had this before, that is a big kid that's not super strong, doesn't move incredibly well, what do you need to focus on? He's got a lot of body weight. I would say speed because that's what you can get done the quickest. And by being able to move through a movement pattern quickly, you're going to produce more force. And it can take years to get strong. Correct. And, and the reality of it is, if you're getting the motor patterns down correctly, the strength will come. It's just a process. It takes time. But if you can squat correctly, bench correctly, deadlift correctly, clean correctly, do the plyometrics correctly, you're going to inherently get stronger. Yeah, exactly. Like it's impossible not to get stronger if you're doing all the motor patterns correctly. Right. It's just impossible. Yep. And so I think what we can glean from that is if you've got a guy that's big, tall, and heavy, then working on getting the good range of motion as well as having the ability to move quicker when performing that range of motion, that's probably the best thing in the short term. Yeah, agreed 100%. And Rome's not built in a day, but you'll see results pretty quickly with a big guy that's putting in the effort, especially if he's going home and mm -hmm. doing the stretching and things that you prescribe for him to do. Yeah. That's when you've really hit a gold mine on some of these guys. Because mm -hmm. if they'll go home and do, I always teach them to do the alphabet with their ankles. Mm -hmm. and just simple stuff you can do sitting around watching TV. Well, then all of a sudden it shows up in the weight room very quickly. Yeah, and that's one thing that I've noticed over the over recent years is that neural activation is more and more important than ever. What I mean by neural activation is there's, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but now they're starting to call an issue people have with their glutes not working, gluteal amnesia. Huh. And so it basically your nervous system is not recruiting those muscles anymore because we're sitting on them so much. Yeah. So just being able to get it to move through a full range of motion and doing a few exercises that actually make those muscles contract can make you a lot stronger right away just because it's the biggest muscle in your body and hasn't been doing anything. Yeah, because you've been sitting on your ass. Exactly. Literally. Yeah, literally. Your body does whatever you ask it to do no matter what. And if you can have a kid come in, you have a good protocol to get their nervous system to recruit muscles that it hasn't been doing, it's going to seem like they've been in the weight room for a year. Mm -hmm. Now let's change gears a little bit. Now we got a big tall guy that's a basketball player or a pitcher. Not really heavy, but long legs, long femurs like we talked about, six foot four. Let's look at basketball first. So in high school, a kid that's six four, six five is probably going to be a center. What do you think the first thing a tall, skinny kid is going to be missing? So if big, tall, skinny kid comes in. I mean, he's not going to be very strong because he's tall and skinny. Exactly. That's <laughs> the, yeah, and that's probably the first, the first thing that, that your basketball coach is going to say. We've got to get him stronger in the yeah, post. Yeah, he's got to be able to finish. Mm -hmm. And so that's. That's something that is going to be more of a challenge, I think, than if you had a big kid yeah, it, that's heavy. Especially because, and this is stereotyping basketball kids a little bit, they don't like the weight room. Right. Once they start seeing the results, they love the weight room. Yeah. But initially, you know, I don't know if it's a concept that's taught at the younger ages or whatever, but, you know, that like basketball players don't need the weight room, which right. is silliness. It, you don't, you don't need but to be so strong to play basketball. I, I agree there. But physically being able to hold up through a long season, running up and down that hardwood floor, being able to be explosive and jump, all those come come from strength training. And if you're old enough to remember Alonzo Mourning, he was in the weight room a little bit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Six foot ten, he could bench 350. Yeah, long arms, man. Yeah. And so it's only going to help. we got to work on getting that kid stronger. So what are some of your favorite lifts – let me, let me ask it this way. Favorite lifts that they're going to be good at naturally? That they're going to be good at naturally. Honestly, I, I normally start with just getting them through some heavy goblet squats mm -hmm. because they're able to do it correctly. But putting the bar on the back really changes things. Yeah. And having the, gra the center of gravity kind of in the front mm -hmm. helps them learn to sit back, and then we can develop that way. And once we're able to get fairly strong with the goblet, then I start putting the bar on the back. But I try to make it. I try to make it applicable for them that they enjoy and that they can directly see what the result will be. So I do a lot of goblet and a lot of explosive jumping early with them mm -hmm. so that they say, oh, okay, yes, the race is going to be really low to my basketball. And then I really jump into the things that are really, really important. 
Yeah. You start giving them what they want so you can give them what they need. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to get the buy in a little bit, you know, sure. emotional piggy bank a little bit. Though. That's right. Yeah. And I like, I like front squats or goblet squats because they're a little bit punitive, which means if you don't do it right, something bad's going to happen. Yeah. You might drop it, that kind of thing. And you're going to feel it. You can think you're doing a back squat correctly and be a foot high and nobody knows, the, you know, you don't know the difference because you've right. never really done it. You know, with that little bit of front loaded weight, it's going to tilt you forward. You're going to fall back. You're going to feel your knees caving. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little more feedback related. Yeah. And that's one thing that, another thing that I do is if I have someone that's really limited in their range of motion, their ankles and hips, I'll have them do a goblet squat, but on a bench. Mm -hmm. That way they know what it feels like to sit back that far and to stand up from it. And I've noticed that when I move from that to a, to a movement that's not assisted by a bench, they know that it feels weird and feels different if they do it wrong. Yeah. You know, as much as that you can do it. Yeah. So... A lift that I think is really good for somebody in that position would be a deadlift. Mm -hmm. They would probably, wouldn't you say, a little bit better at that naturally too? Man, you know, it's weird. You wouldn't think one of our better deadlifters right now is our six foot five center. Mm -hmm. You know, in the school. I mean, yeah. he's, he's got, I mean, six five and skinny and deadlifts 400 pounds on mm -hmm. a regular bar, not on a trap bar. Right. You, you, so you wouldn't necessarily think that, but those guys really sometimes have, have great deadlift form because they're used to being in an athletic stance, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, playing defense, you know, and, and trying to close out and do. So that position is not abnormal to them. And I would imagine that limb length comes into play there, it, too. It does. <clears throat> but, it, you know, even with those, you know, you run into those guys that could have a long femur and a short short wingspan. So, you know, if, if the body mm -hmm. matches, you know, long wingspan, long femur, you know, it, it's, it allows a good body position. It's, yeah. You know, you, you're running those guys that are freaky that have the, the short femur and the really long arms, and they'll have to pull a deadlift like six inches. And They're going to pull some weight. Yeah. yeah. There, there was a guy that I played with in college. He was six foot seven. And people used to rag on him because his bench wasn't that good. Well, he's got a, a mild oppressive bench. Yeah. And he had shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. he, he weighed 300 pounds. He could bench his weight, but not much more. That's not bad. But he deadlifted over 700 pounds on a trap bar. I mean, he had long arms and short femurs, and the trap bar is not the same as a, a straight bar, but that's still strong. Yeah, and, especially for an athlete. Right, and if you get a hold of him, excuse me, if he got a hold of you, you knew he wasn't weak. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's that's one thing. I, I feel like deadlift's a good one for a kid that doesn't have a lot of experience in the weight room that can just pick it up and you yeah. keep their shoulders and, back. And the irony of this is there'll be a million people that tell you that, oh, they shouldn't be deadlifting. You know, it's the dangerous lift. It's how you hurt your back. I'm like, you want to build some resilience? You got to put your body in positions to build the resilience. Yeah. And to me, if time is short and this kid's got to be able to finish, that's where you start. Yeah. It's something that, that he can do a lot of, I guess, where he can do a movement with a lot of intensity without having to worry about a ton of form. The, di the big difference, I think the takeaway here is both big guys, tall guys, you've got a basketball center or a tackle in football. You really have to look at, number one, what are their goals coming in? The goals are going to be different. Yeah, absolutely. And then, as, we, as we've said a hundred times before, there has to be an assessment to see where they are and what needs to be improved to get to the goal they're talking about. Uh, th that's one way that you can go into it and determine what you're looking for at least. And that may take a little bit of experience to figure out, you know, to figure out what that needs to look like. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The more time you've done this, the more you can off the cuff kind of watch a guy move around and say, well, it looks like, you know, he's pretty tight here. I mean, even during stretching, you can kind of eyeball it and get an idea of kind of what they're capable of yeah. and watching them play. I, I've been lucky to watch the young man uh, I was describing earlier with a really good deadlift. I mean, he was playing really good basketball this year as a junior, but he is so much more stronger, so much more athletic than he was as a sophomore. He's took the weight room very serious, and, yeah. and it's, it's it's made me happy to see a guy who he's a very quiet kid, doesn't talk a whole lot, score twenty points a game every night. It's like okay, you know, this guy's really starting to figure it out. And you don't not complaining. He lives on game day, does what he's supposed to 
doing because the results are there and it's created a more of a following through some of those guys that are thinking, well, you know, I really don't need the weight room run. I mean, it's working for him. Yeah, and the more success they can have early, the better that's going to be, right? Yeah. So we could obviously go into a lot more detail on what each program looks like, but we want to kind of give you the basics of how to look at it and what needs to be accomplished. Now, big people that, are just average Joes that happen to be tall or heavy or whatever, that needs to be different too, I would imagine. A hundred percent. Your casual gym goer who is a tall, bigger guy probably should be treated a little more like your basketball guy, not your tackle guy. Just working on the fundamentals of new movement and then, you know, your day-to-day life, being able to get up and down stairs and things like that, well, that's where you kind of, you're, you're explosive and jumping and take some time. I'm not all about having great big massive box squats for your casual, um, excuse me, box jump for your casual gym goer, but, you know, being able to hop up on a bench, you know, three feet in the air, you should be able to do that. Right. And that's one thing is I try to keep everything functional with my day-to-day adult clients. And one thing I have them do a lot is, grabbing things farmers carry deadlift anything with a kettlebell is going to work on their grip and client said you know what i always wondered why you had me carry that stuff back and forth and then me and two other guys were carrying a cooler down the beach and they had to keep switching off and i didn't so that's 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 the number one thing i keep in mind is whether you can carry beer or not whenever i train yeah absolutely most important thing it's just funny i had a pretty famous and respected doctor and authority on training we had a conversation one time. We were talking about having uh, older, near elderly people squat. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, why would you do that? You know, there. He's like, they have to get off the toilet. Yeah, they have to get up out of their bed. I'm like, I'm not telling them they have to squat to parallel, mm-hmm. but to be able to engage those movements and those legs are important for those people. And I'm like, man, I would have never even thought about that. You know, that mm-hmm. was me as a you know mid twenties, not really knowing. You know, you don't know what you don't know type thing. Yeah. And I mean, it made me feel about like as smart as that piece of paper right there. Yeah. But then I realized, well, he's a famous, world-renowned doctor for a reason. So. I'll give myself a break. Yeah. yeah. That's one thing that I, I was pretty fortunate. I didn't really understand at the time because it was hard. But I went from training college athletes to training whoever walked in the door. And most of the time, they had a real problem. Yeah. And one thing that I have come to appreciate over the years and some people will argue with me, and that's fine. I can back up what I'm saying. A pre-stretch in, uh, let's say, untrained or under-trained individuals can be really beneficial. So to give you an example, I've worked with the wrestlers here, and when I've had them do bridge or anything that's hip dominant, they don't get a full range of motion. So I've started doing hip flexor stretches beforehand for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden they're in a good position. To give you a an example on the other far end, I had a client I was training once in her home, and she was pretty frail, older lady. Matter of fact, she was so weak that she couldn't sit on the couch and extend her leg all the way. So what I did is I would pre-stretch her hamstrings because just the fact that her hamstrings were too tight was causing more tension than her quads could overcome. Wow. And so by doing that, she was able to build up her quads and that sort of thing. So that's what I mean by a pre-stretch. I don't mean stretch for 10 minutes and jump under a bar. But if you're not getting the full range of motion, that's how you can get it. My list of injuries is so long that it requires me to do some stretching before I get into injury. And I know there's a million studies that say otherwise. But I can tell you right now, when I feel my groin getting ready to snap off the bone because I didn't stretch beforehand, don't care what the study. Yeah, and the big, yeah, exactly. I think the big study that a lot of people are looking at is one that the National Strength Conditioning Association did years ago. But you have to look at the conditions that it's done under. What they did is they had someone stretch for two minutes and walk directly under the bar, the squat, and it made it go down a certain percentage. Of course, you're still fatigued yeah. from the stretch. Give yourself a couple of minutes. You know, it just a lot of stuff's common sense, and. I don't know about these particular people that did this study, but sometimes people want to sound controversial so they can get published. Yeah, that's true too. So you have to keep that in mind that larger guys have to worry about in a gym is you need to know how to use a bar 
and not be machine dependent because sometimes you can't fit in there. Yeah. You know, that's, and, and it, even if you do, it's supposedly one size fits all, but not really. No. And if, and if that's the case, then you're going to put tension at the joint from the wrong spot and you're going to end up with issues that you didn't have before. Correct. The reality of it is, me at 510, 511 is not fitting in the same machine as 6566. Six, six. I don't care how slight of adjustments that they have. It's just the angles are different. Right. And if you're 510, and I'll just be nice to me, more than a 38-inch waist, <laughs> you're not going to fit very well in most of that stuff. No, uh, not comfortably yeah. at least. No. So let's not leave out women here. So when I say a bigger woman or a girl taller, so there's a big difference I have found between training your average high school soccer player, girl soccer player, as opposed to a volleyball or basketball player. And the big thing that you need to keep in mind with female athletes is if there's any kind of, uh, I guess the best way to put it is their knees cave in when they're doing things, that has to be addressed immediately because studies have shown that the width of the hips as opposed to where the knees are in relationship to the hips makes female athletes much more susceptible to ACL injury. Correct, yeah. There was a conference I went to, and there was a physical therapist, and she tried to assert that that wasn't true, but didn't back it up with anything. So I'm going with what I've heard. Yeah, well, I mean, the highest injury rate in high school athletics is girls' soccer, ACL injury. Exactly, and they're all non-contact. So that's one thing. And the taller girls are, what with taller, thinner athletes – that were female, and you'll see the knees going in. And, you know, strength is a real issue with most of them, so you have to focus on, number one, just like with, with guys, getting them moving in the right, plan, right range of motion and then working on them getting stronger. Yeah. And then the shorter uh, athletes, they're a lot of times they'll take to lifting a lot easier than the taller ones. Yeah, because it's difficult. You know, right. it's, it's harder for a taller person to bend naturally in certain positions and do, you know, there's a reason why most world-class powerlifters are short. Exactly. You think about a seesaw. When you're a kid, you're on a seesaw, and your friend weighs much more than you do, then, you know, you have them move up a little bit. You move back. You shorten the lever. It's the same thing with your bones. And if you get to a point where you start looking at either yourself, if you're training yourself or your client, if you're training someone else, as joints and bones and how those work together, it's going to really put you ahead when it comes to putting together a program, I think. Absolutely. So, to kind of wrap it up, big guys, taller, heavier, tall and heavy, certain things that you're going to find that are deficits, no matter what, because of their size. Most of the time, it's going to be range of motion if they're untrained that range of motion is going to affect strength and speed in that particular movement. Girls, very similar, because leverage does not favor one gender or the other. Correct. I feel like, is there anything else you want to add, Burr? I think we've covered the basics pretty well. Um, you know, if you're looking at putting together a strength and, tra strength and conditioning program for people, those are all thoughts that have to go into it. You have to treat your bigger guys different than your smaller guys. Uh, your position group slightly different, your sport slightly different. There has to be some customization and some things that are done particularly for different sporting events and different body types. That's it. So we're going to talk more in other podcasts about other body types. But I think we've covered what we wanted to cover here. All right, Bird, well, we'll uh, catch you on the next one. All right.